Hello, hello everyone. I hope you're all doing very, very well. <coughs> We're uh, into the week, I suppose. And I kind of felt like... I sort of felt like continuing on the reading that we were doing. Hmm. Is my microphone a little bit lower than usual? I think it is. Excuse me. Let me just turn it up just a teensy bit. Because I, I had all of those those issues the uh, last stream. Because it was on a on a laptop, but now we're now we're uh, back on to well here. My my usual my usual setup. So that's a lot better. But I really enjoyed the reading that we did last stream. So I wanted to continue it, and I know the next chapter isn't that long. It's only like 20 or so pages. So we might even go a little bit further and try and push on to the... to the second, or the next chapter after that. The... We're going back on our uh, Medieval Ireland writing, or Medieval Ireland book. Uh, last stream we looked at land use and economy. Now, technically this is the second reading stream, and the first of... Uh, last stream was the first, so I will say that technically we didn't start here. Oh, we didn't start last stream, because I started reading this book uh, first, and I decided I was going to actually read it on stream uh, after I finished the first 30 or so pages, because I thought it was very interesting, and I thought it would kind of fit my style and sorry, I, I'm, I'm weirdly foggy brained today I don't know why <laughs> um, I, I think what I'm going to do is I might do a little recording of myself just reading the first 30 or so pages um, I think that might be not a terrible not a terrible idea Oh, by the way, I have um, I changed around a couple of the sounds. I hope, I hope they're they're nice. Hmm. That doesn't seem to be. There we go. I was wondering where the sound was. Let me drop it down just a little bit. Um. Because I was I was feeling like some of the sounds that I had weren't necessarily conducive to. A more ASMR thing. So I'm hoping maybe the, the fire, I think I made a little bit quieter. And then the the kind of background forest noises that I hope aren't too distracting or too annoying uh, are nice. I, I wanted, I, I like, I'm actually someone when I'm listening to ASMR that if there's a bit of background noise, you know, that kind of white noise static. Um, or sometimes it's like someone's fan in the background or whatever, whatever it might be. I actually quite like that, and I feel like it gives a great, <laughs> I want to say, foundation to the ASMR. I do know that. <laughs> Excuse me. I do know that uh, many people like pure silence and just hearing the sounds. That makes a lot of sense as well. People like high quality, uh, very distinct sounds where the only thing that you can hear is like the tapping or something. But I quite like... I quite like the uh, realness feel, I suppose, is the way I would put it. Uh, the realness, realness aspect of just hearing a little bit of white noise in the background in ASMR. Thank you for the stretch redeem, Crespian. I'll do a quick one. Uh, welcome in, welcome in. I hope you're very, very well. I'm feeling a good bit better today in my in my lower back. Um, I, I, I know exactly what I did to, to injure myself. Huh? That's un very unusual, actually, for me to drop frames. Like that. My connection. Okay, there we go. There's my connection back. Uh, that was quite a surprise. Hmm. Odd. Anyway, I'm sure, I'm sure it's fine. Um, 
I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Might have just been like a spike in the internet for some reason. Hopefully, hopefully these like little tech issues don't keep propping, propping up. It's quite annoying. Um, and if it does, I kind of have an idea of how I might fix that. Uh, just because of the way I'm doing something right now, but hopefully it'll be better. But uh, last stream, we did a lot of reading about the land use and economy. Why you sound so daddy? <laughs> what are you talking about? Daddy? What What does daddy sound like? Wait, actually, I don't want to know what daddy sounds like. I don't want to know what that is. <laughs> but hello, Daya. Hello, Daya Diamandis. One of my one of my very good friends. Your voice sounds deeper than usual. You thought I was sick. The alert came out at the same time as the drop. The witch alert. Uh, it might be that I'm, I guess I'm just talking a little bit deeper, Daya. Kind of trying to give like a, an ASMR feel. I think people tend to prefer a slightly deeper voice. Uh, I know I do if I'm listening to a male ASMR. Although I don't like, I don't like when they're down like here. <laughs> like a cowboy. Oh, <laughs> But, uh, because then it's, it's kind of like, uh, a little bit too much. Uh, there's a, there's a Japanese ASMR, uh, Yachama ASMR, which is so, so good. So, so good. The stream alert. Huh. Oh, maybe that's what that was. So, hmm. That's fine. But, uh, I'm actually going to very quickly shout Daya out to my... To my m thousands of viewers, uh, because Daya is a very cool person, and you guys should definitely check him out. He recently released another uh, cover parody, or parody, I should say, of a of a song called Menhera, and it's it is a banger. By the way, I must say, I must say, it is it is amazing. Um, some some of the lines he had in there are, are really really great. The one, the one about, uh, oh, how does it go again? It's like, it's, it's to do with churning out content, uh, and the algor algorithm. Oh my God. I'm going blank on a line I really liked. He, he, you know, he, he, he puts in a lot of work, so go support him. Uh, he's, he's probably one of the more talented, uh, people I've met in this whole VTubing stuff. Die of love. You are very talented. Very st okay, fine. Not talented, skilled, skilled. I actually, I actually try and, I try to not use the word talented too much, because I feel like the word skilled actually is better because it it it, re it acknowledges the amount of work and passion and time and effort that goes into a lot of high skill things. You know, someone who's an Olympic sprinter or weightlifter or something is not just talented in those things. They're skilled. They may have had a natural inclination towards it, absolutely, that helped them get to that level. But there's an insane amount of skill and training and time that goes into that, too. So, yeah, Daya, you're skilled. Hmm, you'll take it. Good, 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 good. Pat, pat, pat. But uh, we, we had a long, detailed look into the types of things that were traded the the expansion of trade in Ireland when the Vikings came along and started uh, introducing various other things. We also had uh, evidence shown that Ireland wasn't just some backwater kind of cut off area of the world where there was no no trading. There was multiple instances of references to Dublin and uh, finds of Irish coins or Irish goods all over Europe, and it was very seemed like uh, uh, Europe was an interconnected place, and Ireland was a part of that. Now, we're going to be getting into society in 500 to 1100 AD Ireland. Uh, we saw a little bit of this already. Uh, there was mentions of the type of system that was in place, very much a hierarchical structure. 
uh, one uh, heavy a heavy emphasis around cattle rearing, around uh, client client servant based relationships, or rather, mm, that's probably not the right word. Uh, client. Mm, what what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, a sort of a sort of feudal arrangement agreement where you say you know there's a lord who owns land or cattle, and he gives a he he provides that to to the lower people, and they promise to provide him a certain amount of return on that, and then they get to keep the excess or whatever. Um, as part of their tributes, and then over time you had the development of the of the various. Rees, so we went from sort of very much clan-based groups to dynasties beginning to crop up around Ireland much more. In particular, the Unail, uh, supposedly coming from the mythological figure Nile of the Nine Hostages, um, or Nile no N- Nile Noglucht. Was that it? N- Nile Noglucht, I believe it was, was the full Irish name. Um, they eventually would go on to hold the High Kingship of Ireland for many, many years, for centuries, um, and primarily were, were situated in Ulster, uh, I believe it was, uh, West Ulster, and kind of Meath. They also controlled significant parts of Ireland. Uh, often the High Kingship would bounce around between the Northern Unail and the Southern Unail. But uh, we're going to be getting into society. I think one of the things that really stood out from the land use and economy, there was a pretty deep section of uh, Ulster, the Red... Mm, the the uh, the story of the Red Hand of Ulster is a great one. Um, who who was it, again, who, who did the thing? Red Hand of Ulster, origin... Was it was it Nile actually? Who threw his hand? Basically, the story was that they were sailing towards Ulster. Um, these groups of people, and the red hand of Ulster is actually the the symbol of the of the O'Neill family. Again, the O'Neill family, uh, the great Hugh O'Neill, for example, Red Hugh O'Neill. Um, very very prestigious prestigious language, land uh, dynasty. Um, and the red hand is their symbol. But the story goes, anyway, that they were sailing towards this, and the, the shout goes up that the first man to put his hand upon the land would be king, or would claim ownership. And I believe it was two of them who were out in front, and they were racing for it. But one of the kings realized, or one of the chieftains realized, that he wasn't going to make it. The other guy was going to beat him. And so, in a, a fit of quick thinking... He cut off his own hand, and as it streamed bloody and red, he threw it from the boat and landed on the on the land. And so it was his hand that touched the land first, and so it was his place to claim it. It's a it's a pretty pretty fun story. Who who cut off who cut off their hand? Yeah, so, yeah, so it seems to be it depends on the story. Sometimes it belongs to one of the O'Neills or it, or Nile the Nine hostages himself or is a, another person. Well, no, no, you locked. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um... Well, let's get into the uh, the story of society, AD 500 to 1100. And I was saying that the last chapter, we got a really deep in look into slavery. And that slavery was a very big thing, particularly with the Vikings. They, uh, slave trade was heavily uh, good for them, lucrative for them. But there was also slavery, both from Ireland to England, from England to Ireland. And across the the globe, this was just the way things were at that time. <clears throat> the 
Despite popular stereotypes that early Celtic-speaking societies were more egalitarian, or sources reveal early medieval Ireland had a highly stratified society. The surviving laws provide a fairly comprehensive, if somewhat abstract, guide to early medieval Irish society, which is complemented by the evidence of sagas and chronicles. The titles of more than 100 Old Irish, and there's a Old Irish, Middle Irish, and then I think then it gets into, I don't know if it's New Irish, but like the thing that's closer to, to modern Irish. So when it mentions Old Irish, it doesn't just mean, oh, it's old. It's specifically a, a type of a version of the language that was there for a long, long, long ago. Old Irish law tracts composed 650 to 750 AD are known. Roughly a quarter are concerned with status and social categories. Status even figures prominently in law tracts that were ostensibly written on other topics. Early Irish lawyers devoted much time to the classifications of rank and its con concomitant elements. They provided a tally of compensation due to a victim of insult or injury, which was to be paid by the criminal or his family. Ohm runes and such. It probably was a language that was spoken around then. Of course, later on, like I, I imagine that Ohm was probably, you know, one of the first things, and then once written language really came around, then you had this old Irish that, uh, that these law tracks come from. Uh, early lo Irish lawyers devoted much ta time to the classification of rank and its concomitant en ent entitlements. They provided a tally of compensation due to a victim of insult or injury, which was to be paid by the criminal or his family. Each person had a bloody had a body price according to his or her rank, and also had an honor price. The honor price was a form of compensation if someone was publicly insulted through damage to his or her property. People might forfeit their honor price by acting in a manner inappropriate to their station. For example, if a king performed manual labor with a spade, the laws portray a society that obsessed over status and codes of behavior. A crime against someone of high rank brought a much greater penalty than a crime against someone of low rank. Similarly, the oath of someone of high rank automatically outweighed the oath of someone of lower down the pecking order. Across the board, the law gave greater rights to those at the top of the hierarchy. The purpose of early Irish law was not to be fair, but to limit violence and disorder in a society that lacked strong state institutions. The law operated primarily through private or arbitration between kin groups rather than public enforcement. The status of an individual was linked to his or her family, which was quite broadly defined as the descendants of a common great-grandfather. The kin groups could, would, might be entitled to receive or pay legal compensation, which gave it a vested interest in exacting justice if one of its members was a victim of a crime. Similarly, it gave the kin group an economic incentive to discourage members from wrongdoing. A family of low status received little compensation if its members were the victims of a crime, for they had little means to stir up trouble if they were dissatisfied with a legal decision. Whereas a powerful family could wreak havoc. The harsh consequences of the system was that families lower down the social scale were at risk of being attacked with relative impunity by those of higher status. The social rules, therefore, motivated vulnerable classes to seek protection of the elites through citizen, clientship, or other contracts. There was also an incentive for people to try and enhance their social, social status, but this was not easily done. Even if a person overcame the disadvantages of his birth and acquired significant wealth or influence above his rank, the elevated position needed to be maintained for three generations before the increase, increase in social rank was recognized by law. The laws, to a large extent, served to protect the exclusivity of the elite. So we're seeing a very hierarchical, very uh, aristocratic-driven society. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things is the the re the king. Now, of course, who knows how it was in practice. But the king actually wasn't necessarily the only person whose status was the same level as him. I can't be certain, but I believe the 
Philly, the poet, and the druid or the priestly class was also uh, considered a level of rank equal to the king. Uh, bread, let me uh, bread and law hierarchy. Let me. Uh, I'm trying to check. You know what? It's probably going to go through it. So rather than me trying to find this online, uh, let's go. Let's go through uh, the book. <laughs> the unfree. More legal literature was written about the various classes of freemen than about their legal dependents and the unfree, who must have made up the bulk of Irish society. At the bottom of this social hierarchy was the slave. Recent studies have highlighted the role of slavery in societies with a strong warrior ethos, where the enslavement of people, particularly females, is a strategy of war. The capture of peoples was a way of demoralizing rivals. It also provided a crude demonstration of power by accumulating people who could be humiliated through menial labor or tortured by various methods, including rape. The availability of slaves increased during times of war and famine when people might enter slavery voluntarily or sell offspring for food. The slave trade in Ireland also increased as a result of the involvement in Viking trading networks in the 10th and the 11th centuries. While, later, while literary accounts of slavery tend to focus on the seizure of captives, many slaves were born to other slaves or entered that condition as a result of a judicial penalty. Slavery seems to have been accepted in early medieval societies as an economically useful and long-standing institution. It was useful because labor obligations that lords could command from their clients was relatively limited, leaving a shortfall in labor supply. Slaves could be forced to, to fulfill any task under the threat of physical abuse. And this is something you see as well in the city-states of Greece. Um, many of them relied heavily upon upon slavery, particularly the Spartans. Uh, one of the reasons why the Spartans were able to, you know, train to become professional warriors and all that type of stuff was because a lot of the manual labor was being done by the helots, who they had the, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the Spartans come from the island of, where was it again? Hang on. They weren't indigenous to the area of, uh, Lacedaemon. They were actually, uh, Crete, was it? Is that the island of Crete? Yes, I think it's Crete that they came from. And they invaded uh, Lacedaemon and sub subjugated the uh, the people of, of, Helot, of Helos. And, you know, basically they were a slave class. And there was things like the running of the Helots or something like that anyway, where uh, large portions of them would be killed. It was basically free reign by the Spartan families. But they they would do all the the menial labor, and I think the same was in in Athens as well, and that was why you know you would have Socrates and they were able to because they had all this leisure time, all this free time, and different groups dedicated themselves to different things. Slaves could fulfill could be a force to fulfill any task under the threat of physical abuse. There is no evidence for large scale gang labor. Rather, they might work individually or in small groups as farmhands or domestic servants. The socially embedded nature of slavery is indicated in literature. In the saga, Ektra Machen Nedok Mumadon, The Adventures of the Son of Ekad Mugmadon, the mother of Nile of the Nine Hostages, progenitor of the powerful Unil, was said to have been a foreign captive. She not only bore the child of her owner, but also contended with the jealousy of his wife, who tried to make his, her existence as miserable as possible. The ubiquity of slavery is also reflected in legal references to the kumal, kumal, or female slave, as a standard movable unit of value, along with the dairy cow. Slaves might escape their condition through manumission by their owners. Manumission, that's a word I've never heard before. Let's look that up. Manumission. Really? Oh. <laughs> it just, it literally just means release from slavery. 
That's all it means. It's a specific word for being released from slavery. Manumission by their owners, escape or accumulating private wealth, but the majority of it must have been a lifelong condition. Above the levels of slaves were the half-free. Uh, we're getting into uh, specific terms in Irish, so I hope I will be able to. And the thing is, these were probably old Irish terms, so the actual pronunciation might be vastly different to the way I'm going to pronounce it. Or at least, significantly. The half-free were individuals of free descent, but who lacked an honor price or land, and so they lacked self-sufficiency. Their lord had legal responsibility over them, and was liable for their fines, but he was also entitled to their compensation. Thus the half-free were able to make legal contracts without their lord's permission. The lord could also impose any labor requirement upon them. Within this category were tenants at will, or fujri, tenants at will, fujri. According to one legal text were ten different types of fudir. Fuder. Yeah, it's more like fuder. These fine gradations suggest that the fuder encompassed a large number of people. Some gra grades were able to leave their lord on making a payment, although in practice it must have been hard to raise the necessary resources and move elsewhere. If the family of a fuder remained in place for three generations, they became hereditary serfs, or saying saying yeah, some of these spellings are a little bit awkward versus uh, normal Irish. <clears throat> Hereditary serfs, or senkleha, bound to the land they worked, and they could no longer claim a right to leave. I was, I was practicing saying it there for a moment, going back to some easy Irish words. The CH sound in Irish, um, if you see CH in Irish, is usually not a ch, it's a ch. Ch. Chanig is a, is a good example, chanig. It's meant to be said in the back of the throat. That was often a Excuse me, I have to, I had to answer something very quickly. The classification of hand-free, also of half-free, also include, included servants who were entirely dependent on their lords for sustenance. Free farmers. Irish law was mainly concerned with the position of freemen. To be free required a basic level of wealth. According to the old Irish law text, Chre Gablach, branched purchase, the O'Care, or low level of freeman, had his own house and outhouse, land worth seven kumala, equivalent to twenty-one dairy cows, and remember a kumala is a female slave, and livestock to the value, to the total value, of seven cows, a bull, seven pigs, seven sheep, and a horse. He also had the pos to possess a share, a share, in a plough team, a kiln, a mill, and a barn. At the upper end of the scale, the mrigger, or, hmm, mrigfer, mrig, mrigfer, possessed the means to farm independently, included, including having a plough team and a share and a mill that allowed him to grind his own corn. The high-ranking freeman was thus defined by self-sufficiency. A man of freeman status who had not yet inherited property was in a more precarious position. He was the lowest rank of freeman, and did not possess the full entitlements of his more independent peers. For some, the anticipation of an inheritance might never be realized, and so the status might become a permanent condition. Let me take a quick, quick sip of tea. Freemen were expected to enter into contracts of clientship. 
They could have more than one lord, as long as their primary allegiance was identified. In return for an advanced in return for an advance of land and stock and legal support, the client provided food, rent, and services, as well as contributing to his lord's status. The law defines two types of contracts between a lord and a client, which, which might vary in duration. Base clientship could not be terminated prematurely without penalty. It involved a range of obligations, including manual labor. Free clientship was more prestigious and could be terminated by either party at any time. It did, however, involve steeper payments to the Lord. According to the law tract, Ken Shrahig, Law of the Free Fief, or, sorry, that's more, uh, Shureha. If a Lord granted three cows, the free client would, over seven years, return nine cows. The original amount plus a cow for each year for six years as well as providing services of attendance and providing labor. In many situations, the client must have been paying out for his affiliation with someone of higher rank. While legal texts were important guides to lawyers, as witnessed by the copying and glossing of texts, for those of you who don't know, glossing usually just means that uh, if you're copying a text, you might put in an explanation of a certain term or various things, or you might just add something. To the, to the side. You wouldn't be adding it to the main body, you would just gloss the side of it. The detailed prescriptions relating to social rank varied from region to region. It is hard to believe that the terms of agreements would not sub were not subject to negotiation between individuals with preferential terms given to a client of good standing or a kinsman, or with adjustments made according to economic conditions. According to the text, Cain Aklina it, will, it was preferable for lords and clients to be kinmen, kinsmen. A woman born to free parents generally did not have the same rights as a man. According to the old Irish tract on Dira, Honor Price, quote, Her father has charge over her when she is a girl, her husband when she is a wife, her sons when she is a widowed woman, with children. She is not capable of sale or purchase or contract or transaction without the authorization of one of her superiors. While the woman was assigned an inferior position, there were exceptions to this statement. A woman had control over her own personal property, and she could in inherit a life interest in lands if she had no brothers. On, the de on her debt, the land would revert back to the kin group. A family landowner shared some of the same rights as a male counterpart, a female landowner. She was allowed to veto contracts of her husband if they seemed unwise. A woman could also rise to high position independently from a husband through the church as an abbess or through practicing a craft or skill. And this is something actually that is seen right the way throughout the medieval world in Europe as well. Um... Uh, there's a great book I read it on this on this stream actually, that was the uh, those terrible Middle Ages, and it talks about that many women actually had significant power and influence as abbesses and as a uh, as sort of leaders of uh, monastic and church areas. Oftentimes they would uh, have sort of mini I wouldn't call them cities, but the equivalent of towns, because there would be the main monastery or the main church. Often this was a specific monastic groups, nunneries. Uh, where were we? Oh yes. For the most part, though, the laws assume a woman to be married and to undertake farm work as well as child-rearing. Non-farming classes. The law tracts also dealt with classes, classes of society apart from those who worked the land and those who owned it. These included professionals whose vocation was passed down through generations. The learned class comprised lawyers, clerics, and poets. The lines between these vocations could sometimes be blurred. According to er Urecht Beck, small primer, the highest grade of judge needed to possess expertise in traditional law, poetry, and canon law. 
a judge might be one trained within the church or a secular law school. There seems to have been an official judge for every tua, who was chosen by its king and always in his company. In addition, there were secular judges or advocates who could be hired for a fee to adjudicate or arbitrate in legal matters. Clerics had recourse to canon law, but their status is also recorded in secular tracts, which may be reflected which may reflect ecclesiastical influence on Irish law. In the tract Urecht Beck, the archbishop is assigned a status equivalent to a provincial king, while an expert in ecclesiastical learning is giving the same honor price as the king of Atua. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, you see that on a sort almost on a similar level in terms of the hierarchy, which to me is is very very interesting, um, because one of the one of the things I, I often think back to Plato, and and his Republic, where he talks about the the three parts of the soul, and for him the the best form of a state was the one run by the philosopher, and I often wonder, um, you know he what, one of the things that he talks talks about is you know when you have uh, is the stargazer and talks about that the a crew shouldn't uh, rebel against or shouldn't be the ones to decide where a ship goes um, rather it should be the stargazer the one who has the knowledge to understand how to read the stars and direct the ship properly who has knowledge of, of and can guide them and it's a similar argument towards going towards, you know, you should have the person who who knows how to live the good life, i.e. the philosopher, who understands first principles and all this stuff, should be the one guiding society. Um, now, I've always had a little bit of a question for Plato on this one, in the sense of, would an individual who is a philosopher, who is deeply involved in that type of stuff, would they necessarily be a good leader? Now, I'm sure a fully realized philosopher could be. But I often question if there's potential that the skills that make a good philosopher and the one who could get down to such principles that Plato talks about and a good leader are oftentimes very different skills and may require very different uh, abilities and education systems. Um, and it makes me think, you know, the Irish hierarchical system, um, and obviously you know, I'm not saying it was a good thing in the sense that, you know, there were slaves and there was very much unfree people. That's not good. But this idea of having, at least for them, the philosophers of their day, the learned cleric class and the 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 highly educated on a similar level as the kings, um, is interesting to me. And it makes me think back to that type of uh, republic idea. Or rather, Plato's republic, I should say. Uh, where were we? Ah, yes, here we were. There is an interesting si symmetry in the laws between the hierarchy of clerics and that of secular poets. The late 8th century law tract, Urecht Narir, primer of stipulations, lists seven grades of phila, or learned poets, and the three subgrades. This follows a structure of seven grades of clerics and three sub subgrades found in Collectio Cano Canonum. Hibernesis, and in various forms across Latin Europe. The skilled poet was defined by the term phila, which literally means seer. The term reflects a perceived overlap in early medieval societies between learned and supernatural powers. While the Druids were purposefully denied status in early Irish laws, but their continued existence is hinted at in early texts, the role of phila in Irish society adapted to the new order. Poets held important social functions in Christian society, including the praise of kings, storytelling, and memorization of genealogy and history. The, they, their position was often complementary, rather than antagonistic to the church. Members of the learned class were able to ascend of their respective career structures through study and merit, although family connections helped. Poets, like clerics, were able to cross political boundaries and maintain their status. This freedom of movement was important for the spread of knowledge, and it meant that these members of those professions often served as ambassadors as they traveled between royal courts. Thank you, Witty, for the lurk. I hope you're having a wonderful day. 
poets could also be classified as entertainers. The main difference between the high-ranking phila and the lower-level bards was that the former were scholars, and the latter were not. At the end of the poetic ranks were those who composed satire. Their performances, then as now, were irreverent and could threaten political and clerical elites. For this reason, early Irish law evinced disapproval of their arts. Particular censure is reserved for female performance of illegal satire. Women poets were, are occasionally mentioned in laws and chronicles. However, such women appear to have been in a minority and generally excluded from higher ranks. It was perhaps the generally low status of female poets that made their satire seem particularly derogatory to those in power. Other entertainers mentioned in law and literature were musicians, jugglers, jesters, acrobats, and the profession <laughs> and the professional farter, who presumably performed for comedic effect. I would assume so. <laughs> Lucky and talented performers, performers may have held celebrity status, performed at the most prestigious royal courts, and won positions of influence. At the other end of the scale, those with less luck or talent presumably had a more precarious existence, struggling to find patrons who would support them. Nothing was really changed, we all just laugh at the same things. Practical professions ranged from physicians to smiths, and these had obvious social worth. While these tasks occupy different social niches today, they were classed together in early Irish legal texts as nemed, or sacred, along with poets, clerics, and nobles. It is likely that physicians, like poets and jurists, were awarded higher status the greater their learning and expertise, although the laws do not provide clear evidence of this. Higher ranking and clerical physicians may have been expected to acquire scientific learning from foreign manuscripts and to combine it with knowledge of folk medicine. As with the role of poets, there is evidence of women achieving recognition, recognized status in this field. The law text Brehe Krulig, Krulige makes specific reference to the woman physician of the Tua, whose main task may have been midwifery, but who also might have been an expert on herbal lore. The high value of craft people is recognized in Urecht, Urecht Beck, where the most skilled of carpenters commanded an honor price greater than the highest grade of judge. Higher? Whoa. Greater than the highest grade of judge. According to the laws, those of the most... Oh. According to the laws, the honor price of metal spits did not exceed more than half of that of the most skilled carpenter. However, the blacksmith was also an important figure. In a pretale to the famous saga Tain Bakulina, the cattle raid of Cooley, the smith Kulan, Kulan was of sufficient standing to invite the king of Ulster to a feast. Folklore and mythology surrounds the character of skilled craftspeople in many early cultures. Low-leak manufacturers such as letter workers and comb makers are also mentioned in laws. Their suggested honor price was equivalent to a yearling heifer. Craft peoples worked on commission, but also sold their wares from their premises. However, merchants and porters also played a part in medieval society, transporting goods from source to market and dealing with overseas trade. In early medieval society, the social dealing, oh, the significance of trade often rivaled its economic purpose. Trade often took the form of reciprocal gift exchange or barter. Coin circulation remained limited even after a mint opened in Dublin in the 990s. Exchange, therefore, required social interaction and negotiation. The laws encor encouraged members of a kin group to offer goods for sale to each other first to help promote each other's prosperity. Hmm. Very interesting. Lords could also expect first choice of goods offered for sale by their clients. In pre-Viking Ireland, access to exotic items or luxuries was a pr prerogative to the elites. Overseas trades was controlled by royalty or by churches that could distribute imports to favorable subjects or allies. Messengers and carriers could also be commissioned to take goods over longer distances. Traders received little mention in Irish laws of the 7th and 8th century. However, in the 10th century, merchants acquired wealth and social influence as overseas trades grew in significance. Hiberno-Scandinavian ports grew in size to handle this trade. 
Their bicultural identity was an asset, for it eased access to Norse-speaking communities abroad and the use of Scandinavian shipping technology. Hiberno-Scandinavian merchants might also have been less enmeshed, enmeshed with the social ties of the Irish Tuatha, so that their exchange, exchanges could focus more on profit. In addition to their reputa reputation as traders, Hiberno-Scandinavians were, were often alluded to in Irish literature as warriors. From as early as the mid 9th century, Vikings became entangled in the disputes of Irish kings, as well as with each other. The political instability of the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries may have led to greater use of mercenaries. The middle word for a warrior, sutruk, is, the is derived from an old Norse word, svartleggja, meaning black leg. Nevertheless, fighting men held an important place in Irish society well before the Viking Age. Thank you for the hydrate. My tea's almost cold, oh no. That's not too bad. It's okay. It's enough to, to wet the palate. <laughs> Laws refer, refer to royal bodyguards who helped protect the court and the king's body from harm. Saints' lives and sagas also refer, often disapprovingly, to warrior fraternities who lived on the margins of society and lived by plunder and through offering service as mercenaries. The, these groups were often known as Fianna. <laughs> the taking of arms was a rite of passage and a sign of free status. For young men of free stock who had not received their share of kinland, the warrior lifestyle offered a transitional stage between youth and the entry into respectable membership of the Tua. Warrior bands may also have provided career paths for outlaws, renegades, and outsiders. It was a high-risk choice, but potentially it offered high rewards. The mobility, risk-taking, and violence of the warrior made him a popular figure in literature, as shown by the stories of Cú Chulainn and Finn Machúl. Talented warriors could elevate their status from commoner to a low grade of lord by being appointed to oversee blood feuds between Tua. Another means of increasing social rank was for wealthy individuals to take on the ro role of hosteller. This was a non-military role that required a man to maintain a house on a public road that offered hospitality to all, according to rank, as frequently as it was commanded. If the hosteller owned twice the property of a lord, he obtained equal status. Hostels must have served an important role as meeting places. <clears throat> They are the settings for traumatic conflicts in Shkela, Muk Macdaho, the tale of Macdaho's pig, and Togal Brynna de Dederga, the destruction of the Dederga's hostel. This may reflect on the real risk of bandits and brawls in such places. To run a hostel may have been an expensive, demanding, and sometimes risky enterprise, but it offered a route for social climbers in a highly stratified society. Lords, Kings, and Consorts Early Irish laws placed more emphasis on economic productivity as a means of enhancing wealth and social rank than on fighting and raiding. This predisposition may reflect clerical influences, for warfare posed economic and moral dangers to the church. If a, noble, if a non noble freeman accumulated sufficient wealth to distribute fiefs and acquire clients, he could secure noble status for his male descendants. According to the law text Crit Gobloch, the lower grade of lord was a man who had a minimum of ten clients, five in free clientship and five in, f in base clientship. The highest grade of lord had forty clients. However, the possession of wealth and clients over several generations was not the only characteristic of lords. They might also hold public office or exercise military duties. The privilege of lordship included a collection of food renders and control over the labour of others. The immense lands of a lord were worked by slaves, hereditary serfs, tenants at will and base clients, rather than by his own hands. A lord held status within his tua, such as the right to act as a surety and lead his own retinue in battle. 
he had the economic means to offer hospitality to people of higher and equal rank who could help build alliances, and the privileges of a good education and a noble marriage for his offspring. The number of ranks of lords varies between law texts. Originally, there seems to have been three grades, with an additional grade, Lord of, Supre of Superior Testimony, Era Forgil, developed by the late 8th century. The reason for this addition may have been that the lordly class was expanding due to downward mobility from royal lineages. This could be the result of multiple royal unions creating large numbers of offspring whose status could not be maintained. It may have also resulted from a restriction in the number of lineages that held royal office as power became more centralized. Leading noble lineages could hold the honorari honorary title Regdamna, or royal material, which suggests their royal ancestry. While some of these lineages may have been contenders for royal status, over time this title seems to have become a, consola consolation, a consolation prize for those excluded from power. At the top of the social hierarchy or kings, their power was said to ex extend beyond society into the realms of the supernatural. To unlawfully unseat a king might therefore cause natural disaster, but also the king himself had to follow rules and respect inherited taboos to keep the natural order in place. This overlap between myth and law was more, most clearly demonstrated in legends concerning the kingship of Tara. And you guys can look at the Hill of Tara in County Meath. To, uh, there's an image here, but I didn't have it prepared, I'm sorry. The origin of these myths relate to the idea of the king as a symbolic spouse of the goddess who represents his kingdom. The sacred marriage is a phenomenon with Indo-European parallels. However, the sacral role of early Irish kings was also linked to the Old Testament examples, including David and Solomon. The king was not free to act as he pleased, as his rule was hedged around, around by supernatural and social prescriptions. In Ireland, the king did not write the laws. This was the job of clerics and professional lawyers. The king, nevertheless, held an important legal role in approving the judgments of courts and adjudicating in difficult cases. A king could issue new laws in a state of emergency, be it political, environmental, or moral. A number of these laws were linked to the church. Examples include Cain Dari, which sought to prohibit cattle raiding at a time of social disorder in the early 9th century. A difficult, different grades of king, kingship were recognized in early Irish law. The lowest grade of king, kingship was the ruler of a single community, or a tua, who commanded an honor price of seven kumala, or female slaves. And remember that um, for someone to be considered free, the amount of land that they had to, I think, I think it was like their total assets had to be around seven kumala. So this one guy has the honor price. If you besmirch his honor, uh, you have to pay the price of a free man. At the top end was a provincial overking whose honor was rated at 14 kumala. The notion of a high king of Ireland was recognized in literature from the late 7th century, but it does not find expression in the laws. Like the Bretwalda, Britain ruler of Anglo-Saxon history, the title might be flatteringly applied to the most powerful provincial rulers. These were kings in a position to intimidate their rivals, but their claim to king kingship over all the uh, mm. but their claims to kingship over all the Irish lacked political substance. Ireland did not possess a centralized mon monarchy in the early Middle Ages. During the period under discussion, and this is something actually that you see in in uh, in feudalism as well in France, the oftentimes the person who was the king in early medieval France was just another like duke essentially who happened to be sometimes not even the most powerful duke. It was just a it was just a case of. This was who people saw as king. He was a person that most of the other groups kind of gave fealty to. Often in a very uh, tense situation. Uh, 
During the period under discussion, the lowest layer of kingship, based on Tuatha, lost some authority to kings of higher rank, the Ruri and Ri Kokit, Kokit, sometimes serving as their agents and becoming king to the level of lords in other parts of Europe. The number of lineages that aspired to kingship also decreased over time. During the 11th century, a handful of provincial royal lineages competed to unite Ireland under their rule, but no single dynasty held power long enough to make this a reality. <sighs> Who knows what could have happened? The title Regan, Queen, began to appear in annals from the mid-8th century. The annals of Ulster consistently give death notices of queens of Tara from the late 8th century, and it occasionally mentions others. These women were identified by their patronym, or the name of their husband, or simply by their title. Each of these women may be identified as the Setwinter, or legal spouse of the king. Only one queen is listed for each king, although he may have had, although he may have no, been known from other sources to have plural legitimate or illegitimate unions. The policy of identifying one spouse may reflect the interests of the church in promoting marriage as a lifelong commitment. The records also may suggest the growing importance of queenship in medieval Ireland. As O'Neill kings contended for control throughout Ireland from the 8th century, the choice of legal spouse or set winter was an important way to build a lasting allegiance with a powerful family. This made the queen an important ally in the king's power building strategy. A list of royal consorts dating from the early Middle Ages is also provided by the 12th century. Banshenkis, the lore of women. This gives an entirely this gives a different picture from the annals of Ulster. It has been convincingly argued that the Banshenkis account of royal wives was drawn from the list of the mothers of kings. Thus, while only one spouse is assigned to each of the important kings who are listed, that spouse is sometimes a different partner from the one recorded in the annals. From AD 1000, the record of the lore of women becomes fuller and often multiple consorts of kings are recorded. This re may reflect a change in sources, which allowed more detail to be included, and it may provide a more accurate reflection of the sex lives of kings. The intense competition between provincial overkings in the 11th and 12th centuries may have encouraged rulers to build up a wider network of alliances through their choice of wives and mistresses. The marital practices of royalty may be mirrored on a more modest scale by the nobility. A king or lord may choose a Simwinter from the family of an important ally. He might also have a less formal partnerships with women from families of lesser allies, or simply have sex with a woman of low status based on amorous, amorous rather than political interests. In Northern Europe, laws of primogeniture and legitimacy were not strictly enforced until the 11th century. Although the son of a legitimate spouse might be, might be prioritized in matters of inheritance, any sons whom a leader recognized, born to a free woman, might gain a share of his wealth or his position. They, this might have heightened the jealousies that could arise between wives and mistresses, as their offspring might compete for favor and power. Some leaders avoided such domestic disharmony through chastity or by embracing celibacy. For married women, however, Fidelity was expected. The consequences of a perceived breach in conduct could be fatal, as illustrated in the execution of Orla, wife of Danca, son of Flan, king of Tara in 941. She was accused of having illicit sexual relations with her stepson Ongus. This did not prevent Ongus from succeeding to the kingship three years later. It is possible that a political motive was involved in this complex relationship. Ongus may have been seeking to usurp his father, or Donka may have wanted to slight the royal dynasty of Dalkeish, Dalkeish to which Orla belonged. And uh, Dalkeish was, uh, I believe, the dynasty that Brian Baru eventually comes from. And around this time, 9 for 1 was kind of their ascendancy. They were really starting to come into their own. The social anxieties that arose over the sexual propriety of elite women were expressed as themes in Irish sagas. In a number of instances, a new ruler married the widow, former wife or daughter of a previous king or lord, 
These acts might be considered construed as crude assertions of power over women, formerly under the authority or protection of other men. However, these marriages could also reduce conflicts over succession to power by offering a degree of continuity in life at court, or they might help maintain a political alliance between the wise family and the success of rulers. It is also worth considering the value of wives as advisors. Elite women presumably acquired a working knowledge of the politics of the kingdom or lordship they dwelt in, its allies and the leading personnel. This knowledge would be of great use to a new ruler. The important role of the queen in this respect might have been seen in the law text Crick Gobloch, which assigns the king's consort the equivalent place to his judge in the layout of the royal household. The duties of the royal or aristocratic wife might extend to diplomacy and overseeing hostages who were retained at her husband's court. Vreha Krulig identified women who were of particular value in a tua, in a tua including the hostage ruler and the woman who turns back the streams of war. Mm. Now that's quite the title. Marriage. Elite in men and women were often political pawns in the marriage market. Women in particular might be obliged to enter into a series of unions until they were past childbearing age. The woman's right to select her own marriage partner in marriage is recognized in law, but in reality, women across social ranks seemed to have limited freedom in choosing their partners. The laws seem to expect girls over 14 years and men over 20 years of age to enter into sexual unions. The main alternative for those who did not wish to marry, or who did not wish to marry again, was to seek refuge in the church. Early canon laws suggested clerics could also marry, although sec sexual relations might be forbidden for priests or higher-ranking clergy. <clears throat> In the late 11th century, the influence of papal reforms which demanded clerical celibacy was felt in Ireland. However, that proved to be difficult to enforce. There were in evidently some divergence between what the church and secular laws might define as marriage. The law of couples, Cain Lam Lana Lanamna, identified nine, nine forms of union, ranging from marriage of joint property between partners of equal rank to sex between two people who are insane and therefore incapable of raising a child. <laughs> there was a distinction between having a legal spouse, what the church would recognize as a marriage, and other forms of sexual union that might produce offspring. These alternative unions were legislated for in secular law so that the woman and her children received some legal protection. The laws presented the picture of the ideal marriage as a monogamous union between partners born of families of equal rank. However, there was little equality within marriage. In Cain Lanna, the relationship between a husband and wife is likened to that between a teacher and a pupil, a church and its monks, and a lord and his base client. Thus, the male head of the household legally wielded authority over his wife, his children, and his slaves. While partners may have been born of equal wealth and status, the honor price of a wife was half that of her husband, that of a concubine was a quarter. The type of union that remained, or the type of union between a man and woman, determined the level of association that remained between a woman and her kin. In the case of a legal spouse, a uh, Ket Munter, one third of any fines went to her family. If a woman was abducted against the will of her family, all assets that she was entitled to went to her family, and all liabilities fell to her abductor. This included the duty to provide for her children. In the case of a prostitute, all liabilities and entitlements fell, fell to her own kin, kin group. <laughs> okay, that's quite, quite the line. I wasn't expecting that one. <clears throat> In secular law, excuse me, I'm just going to have another uh, hydrate. In secular law, marriage was perceived as a contract involving rights and responsibilities and property. As part of this contract, a man was expected to pay a bride price to the father or a guardian of his intended spouse before witnesses. The woman was entitled to keep a share of her bride price. Her family was also expected to contribute property, and normally the woman was expected to move into the man's household. If the couple split without blame, the bride price was kept by the bride and her family, as was the share of property she brought to the union. The man retained his property, and the profits of joint labor within the marriage were split. 
These rulings revealed different expected gender roles, with the wife being more involved in the tax, tasks of milking, food processing, and cloth manufacturing, and the husband's role relating more to the cultivation of crops and the care of livestock. The household economy of medieval Ireland thus bound man and wife in a mutually dependent relationship. In addition to its economic utility, the main purpose of marriage was the production of offspring. Where grounds of divorce are discussed in legal texts, these often relate to matters of fertility and child-rearing, or the insult to a partner through theft, slander, or infidelity. Where one party is seen to carry the blame for a divorce, the share of property that partner takes away from the union is reduced. In the late 11th century, the secular laws came under criticism from church reformers who wished to ban most grounds for divorce and to make all forms of union, apart from the first official wedding, illegitimate. The importance of family is defining... Oh, this is uh, under the heading of inheritance. The importance of a family is defining individual status and providing legal protection has already been touched upon. It also determined access to kinland in wealthier families. The old Irish law text, Dolib Kinol Tuahi, on the divisions of the kin group of the Tua, describes four family groups. The smallest is the Gelfina, the bright kin, referring to those related within three generations, i.e. descended from a common grandfather. And the largest, largest is the Infina, the end kin which comprises a group related through the male line within six generations. The rules of inheritance are laid out as follows. When a man dies, the land is divided between his sons. If he has no offspring, his land is shared between members of the Gelfina. If there are no relatives related within three generations, then, th then three quarters of the land is divided between relations within four generations, the Durfina, true kin, and the remaining quarter is shared between those related within five or six generations. A daughter could share a life interest in land if she has no brothers, but this property would revert to the male members of the kin group on her death. Land was such an important resource within farming societies that clear rules of inheritance were needed to prevent bitter conflicts from arising. Scholars have debated the mechanisms of kinship and inheritance, but the evidence of Dolib Kinol Tuahi may be best interpreted as following the principle that the Gelfina was a kin group that comprised of the three generations of living adults. Membership of a kin group changed through an individual's lifetime, just as the family we are born into differs in its membership from the one that exists when we die. A man might expect to belong to three different Gelfina within his lifetime. When he came of age, he would join the Gelfina defined by common descent from his grandfather. When his sons reached maturity, his Gilfina would be defined by those sharing common descent from his father. When his grandchildren reached maturity, he became the defining figure of his Gilfina, binding all men descended from him in three generations. If a man lived to see his grandsons mature, his total kindred extended to the maximum extent recognized by law. This is the end kin defined by six generations, comprising all the living descendants of his great-grandfather, extending down to the generation of his grandchildren. The importance of kin groups in defining land inheritance is reflected in the name of places in the Irish landscape. Thousands of townlands still bear the names of families who once owned them. Regarding the division of land, the principle was that sons took an equal share in the lands that had belonged to their father. However, sons of dubious parentry, paternity, or who were bad sons could be excluded. Daughters would usually only receive a share of movable goods, so that the kinland was retained in a line of patri patrilineal descent. The church seemed to have favoured eldest sons in matters of inheritance, and an old Irish legal commentary assigned the paternal house and farm buildings to the eldest son. However, this might not always have been observed in practice. The laws also allowed for a share of property to be granted to the church. Naturally, there was a risk that through population growth in successive generations, the share of kin land would be whittled down to the point where families risked losing wealth and status. This was in part compensated by the redistribution of lands within the kin group when one of the male members died without offspring. It could also be offset by the acquisition of more land. 
land purchase is not well documented in early medieval Ireland. Communal memory may have often been sufficient to confirm transactions. However, a pan-European trend towards greater use of written documentation in the 11th century encouraged the use of charters in Ireland. One example, copied into the Book of Kells, records the purchase of land around 1092 AD in the parish of Dungau, Dunamore, County Meath, by a Ua Breslian, Breslian, priest of Kells and his kinsmen. As well as land and movable goods, professions and offices were often hereditary. Any male members of an office, holders der Finna, might inherit the title, which could give rise to a large number of contenders. This could lead to conflicts between candidates, particularly in relation to the office of kingship. These rules worked to help ensure that professional and official dynasties did not die out, and that from a pool of eligible ca- candidates, that the most worthy might succeed. In relation to kingship, some laws sought to limit the sexual activity of kings, perhaps in a bid to limit the number of offspring. For example, a king might not go out alone, lest a woman claim that he had fathered a child on her. Laws also favoured the position of the king's official wife, Kek Winter, and by granting her greater esteem, this may have given some advantage to her offspring in matters of succession. If the Ked Winter came from a powerful family, this would improve the chances of her sons, of her sons succeeding the power. The risk of violent succession disputes was also diminished, 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 when a royal heir was chosen during the king's lifetime. Succession often favoured the oldest male son or grandson of a previous ruler. Older candidates had had the opportunity to acquire relevant life experience and build up their network of supporters. A royal candidate also had to be publicly recognised for his personal excellence, the old Iris Fabas, and the charisma. Smart, yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I might start implementing that in my life. I might need you guys to start, uh, start coming out with me whenever I go anywhere in case a woman claims that I, that I uh, fathered her child. They're not gonna get my. They're not gonna get my. Uh, my campfire, my lands. Oh, I forgot. I actually forgot. I wanted to put this little guy here. I wanted to put him here. That can be you guys being all comfy. He he just sits by the. Would it would it be cuter if he was sitting up here? <laughs> that does look cute. He's sitting on a little on a little log. Hang on, I'm gonna move him down just slightly. Cute. <laughs> Where two or three ba- branches of royal kindred were well matched in strength, the kingship might alternate between them. This arrangement could be long lasting. A prime example of this, and I talked about this earlier actually, um, a prime example of this is the Unail kingship of Tara, which alternated between the dynasties of Clan Colman and Kennel Egg Nguyen, or Nguyen, in the 9th and 10th centuries. This method of power sharing between royal branches would often be preferable to waging a zero-sum war where one family might lose everything. Some royal candidates might also choose to opt out of a succession to become allies or courtiers to the next king. Courtiers to the next king. This might be a safer choice for a weaker candidate, for it was not uncommon for unsuccessful contenders to be killed or maimed. It was common for an unsuccessful claimant or excluded lineage to be compensated with a position in the church. While early royal Irish royal succession is often portrayed as chaotic, there was a clear rationale to the system, which sought to elevate the most able candidates to power, although it was not always successful in limiting conflict between rivals. In the last section of this chapter, Fosterage and Alliances. To mitigate the risks of conflict or downward social mobility, alliances could be formed across kin groups. It seems to have been normal practice among the wealthier classes to send children away for a young age to a foster family or church. This practice helped form alliances by building intimate links between the children's family and the households or communities that received them. The institution was also regarded as beneficial to the child's education. 
Furthermore, it could reduce emotional tensions in households where children from one father but different mothers might otherwise live together. The period of fosterage began before a child reached seven years of age and continued until the age of 14 or 17, according to different accounts. The fosterage arrangement could be undertaken either free of charge on the grounds of affection between two families, or for a fee that was calculated according to the gender and rank of the child. The foster parents were required to educate and maintain the foster child accordingly. For example, the daughter of a noble is taught sewing, but the daughter of a high-ranking farmer is taught bread-making. Um, and we, we actually see this in some of the old... Uh, some of the old Irish uh, mythology as well. In is it the Thorn or is it another side story to the Thorn? I think it might be in the Thorn Bakulina itself. Basically, the story of uh, of Cucullin killing his own his own foster brother, and you know that's quite the quite the difficult thing to do. The importance of links between foster kindred is a recurrent theme in Irish sagas and ha Hagi hagiography, and this must to some extent mirror social realities. Oh, they're literally about to talk about it here. Like, why am I even here to give, like, little comments? One of the most poignant scenes in the saga Tain Makulana, the cattle raid of Cooley, is when the warrior Cúchulain is forced to kill his foster brother, Ferdaid, and utters a poetic, poetic lament over his dead friend. Fosterage, fosterage and marriage were forms of artificial kinship that could bind families across political boundaries, but these relationships could also be strained by the changing course of events. Alliances between families or polit polities might be formed for, for a temporary goal, such as a military campaign against a common enemy. Relations could also be formalized by treaties. Chronicles give many instances of agreements being made to end or prevent wars. Taking the second decade of the 10th century as an example, Peace was made between Ive, over King of Ulster, and Niall Glundub, over King of the Northern O'Neill, in 914. In the following year, Niall extracted a pledge from the sons of Flan Sinna, over King of the Southern O'Neill, that they would end the rebellion against their father. In 918, the King of Northern Brega made an alliance with Vikings in a bid to protect his kingdom. But this failed, and he died, fighting the men of Dublin alongside Niall Glundub in the following year. A fragmentary law text on treaty relationships, called Brehe Cerdi, gives some insight into cross-border agreements, including protection for the subjects of each polity, and rules regarding crimes that were committed by members of one group in the territory of another. Conclusion Early medieval Irish, Ireland, was a highly stratified society. There is abundant evidence in surviving law tracts that gives insight into the many shades of social distinction. The laws were mainly main concerned with the elite in Irish society. It appears that a large share of agriculture and servile rank work was undertaken by ranks of unfree and semi-free men, or semi-free people. Being free, however, did not bring liberty from obligations. People of free status had obligations and responsibilities towards neighbours, kin and allies. They were also bound to provide services and economic support to those of higher rank through clientship, fosterage and tribute giving. In return, the elites provided protection and favours. Opportunity for social advancements were limited. However, it was possible through the accumulation of wealth, professional talent or military skill to climb that greasy pole. Downward social mobility was a challenge for many. Among royal kindreds, the proliferation of heirs and the centralization of royal authority forced a number of families to lose status, which may have brought a downward social pressure to other ranks. The intense competition over status within the highest echelons of Irish society led to frequent conflicts. As a result, the Irish chronicles provide a dizzying tally, tally of violent deaths among the male upper classes. And I've read, I've read uh, a few books. There's one that I would love to read on stream as well, about Brian Baru specifically. But it goes through many of these characters, and you would be amazed at how... Well, I don't think you'd be amazed, but uh, there's many people that are mentioned uh, that die so quickly.
it's very much a uh, uh, being part of the upper echelon of society was definitely a dangerous game if you were among the, the real high end people How long have I been streaming for? Just under an hour and a half, and I'm finished a chapter that I was planning on doing. Hmm. Maybe I keep going? I think I I think I keep going. Uh I probably won't finish this chapter, but we can we can just keep going, I think. At least for another half an hour, because I do need to be I do need to be up early tomorrow. Earlier than usual. Ugh. The next chapter looks at politics from 500 to 1100. Ireland is lucky in the richness and variety of sources that allow analysis of early medieval politics. These include chronicles, law texts, and genealogies. The nature and practice of kingship was the focus of much literary composition. There was a plethora of kings operating at any one point in time in an early medieval Ireland as power remained fairly localised. Therefore, the island's political development is best discussed through the lens of different provincial histories. An overarching theme during the early medieval ages was the rise of the Unail dynasty and their subsequent failure to secure an overship over kingship over all Ireland. The rise of the Dalgaish or the Dalkaish of Munster, who sought, sought and nearly won control of all Ireland under Brian Boru at the start of the eleventh century, shattered the ambitions of the Unail. By the late eleventh century, the overkings of Connacht and Leinster were also competing in the race to win island wide control. And there's some discussion in that book that I that I've read before about Brian Boru. It talks about his dominance over the Unail to to really challenge them may have been a massive break in tradition that may have encouraged other kings to to vie for that position to truly cement themselves and I think he makes a very persuasive argument that this was essentially Ireland in its in its moments of centralization that had it gone on for another few decades or so decade or two, you possibly would have seen the proper arisement of a truly national kingship with authority, full authority, all over Ireland. But that's another book for another time. At the end of the 11th century, the most powerful king of Ireland was the Munster dynast Mercartach Uabrian, who sought to increase his power and prestige through cultivating contacts abroad. The growing links between Ireland and its neighbours would set the scene for the political developments of the 12th century and beyond. The Hierarchy of Kings Kingship in early medieval Ireland was a multi-layered affair, with petty kings being tied in relation of dependence to greater kings. At the bottom of the scale of the king was the king were the kings of one Tua. The legal definition of a Tua was a small but distinct community with its own king, its own church, a poet, and an ecclesiastical scholar. There were more than 150 Tua operating in Ireland at any one time, between the 5th and 12th centuries. Above the petty king was a Tua... Above the petty kings of the Tua was an overking of plural Tuaha, who wielded power through his recognised position of lordship over lesser kings. At the top of the scale were provincial overkings. Ireland was divided in the provinces in the early medieval period, and there was actually five back then, not four as there is now. Munster, Leinster, Ulster, Connacht. Oh, sorry, this is a... Uh, Maybe, maybe, oh wait, no, hang on. It's. I think that's also going to mention groups like the Os Osraig and Lagan and various other groups. <clears throat> Comprised Munster, Leinster, Ulster, Connacht, Meath, which were kind of the traditional five. Now it's just Munster, Leinster, Ulster and Connacht as the four. Brega and the lands of the northwest of the island under the, under the power of the Unail dynasts. 
In the early six, in the sixth century, O'Neill extended their power over the East Midlands and divided into tro- two branches: the Southern O'Neill of Mead and Brega, and the Northern O'Neill in the Northwest. There was an overkingship of Northern and Southern O'Neill, and the remaining provinces had their own overkings. The ruler over both branches of the O'Neill was regarded as the most powerful king of Ireland. The O'Neill overkingship was associated with the ancient site of Tara in County Meath. The legend was developed by O'Neill that there had once been a mythical kingship of all Ireland based here, and they were its rightful heirs. It was an ideal which coloured legends and political ambitions right throughout the Middle Ages. The extent of the power wielded by the historical king of Tara is debated. At times they could wield authority over other provincial kings, but they never achieved direct rule over all Ireland. Power in Ireland was mediated by the language of kingship and personal ties. Genealogies could be rewritten as power changed hands and fictional relationships were projected into the distant past in order to justify the status quo. The origin and relationship of Irish provinces in the early Middle Ages were thus defined through tales of kinship. The old Irish saga, Saga of Fergus MacLitty, identifies three free peoples of Ireland, the Olaid, the people of Ulster, Lagan, the people of Leinster, and Fíní. The leading dynasties of Connacht, O'Neill, and Aganocht of Munster were said to be- belong to the Fíní. More prestigious, more prestige was thus accorded to the descendants of the Fíní when the tale was written. A plethora of early tales concerned the ancestors of different provincial overkings, explaining in heroic or mortal, moral terms why one branch of a royal dynasty would succeed while the other did not. To help maintain their position, I believe uh, Connacht, uh, their founding myth, or therefore founding starter, was Con of the Hundred Battles. To help maintain their position, overkings relied on client kings who might belong to sub-branches of their own family or rulers of unrelated people within their sphere of influence. Ultimately, royal power rested on the number of clients one had, rather than direct control of land, and this fact explains a number of features of early Irish society. It meant that kingship was seen in a contractual rather than an absolute matter. Therefore, there was pressure on early Irish rulers to continually justify and uphold their authority. The Practice of Power The nature of kingship can be explored through early medieval chronicles, biblical literature, laws, gnomic gnomic literature, sagas and poetry. Power was displayed in public events most symbolically, in the act of inauguration at royal sites, but also at assemblies and through the exercise of royal prerogatives such as the exacting hospitality from clients and making legal judgments. The king also relied on his retinue and the work of poets and craftsmen to make his court a centre of cultural and political life. The church played an important role in winning public support for secular leaders, and relations between kings and churches were often cemented through networks of allegiances. It is no surprise that the rhetoric and imagery of kingship in Ireland, as elsewhere in Europe, was heavily influenced by Christian ideologies. From the 8th century, it is evident that the legal independence of Tuatha was being eroded eroded with a concomitant rise in power of provincial overkings. The elevated power of provincial kings required more elaborate practice and ritual underpinnings. This is best illustrated in portrayals of the kingship of Tara, which represented the pretensions of O'Neill over kings to exercise power across all Ireland. The Hill of Tara was a strategic site, overlooking fertile lands in the Kingdom of Brega with an impressive views across the Midlands of Ireland. The low-lying hills of a prehistoric complex of monuments that were associated with ancient deities. deities. The local rulers, Silnero Slain, had been ousted from using this site, and made do with a seat at Raeth Aether, Orristown, County Meath. The most impress- the more impressive site at Tara became the ceremonial focus for the most important Dunail kings, who bore the title King of Tara. In common with other important royal inauguration sites like Cashel and Munster, which I have been, I've been at the Rock of Cashel, it's a uh, it's almost disappointing to see the quite 
dilapidated state of much of it. I often question the idea between allowing us to see what something is like now that we know, you know, existed for hundreds of, even thousands of years for some of those structures and uh, what it would have been like to reconstruct it to the best of our ability. And Rathkrogan in Connacht. That might be Krug, yeah, Krug. The rich archaeological landscape at Tara endowed kings who were inaugurated there with an aura of ancient respectability. There is no detailed account in the inauguration of a historical king of Tara, Tara. although tales of king-making ceremonies here are enshrined in medieval sagas. These associate the inauguration of a king with the celebration of a feast and demonstration of worthy qualities of military power, generosity, truth, and good judgment. In literature, the royal inauguration represented a union between a king and his kingdom. Thus, the leader was presented as a mediator between the society he ruled and the natural forces of his territory. Sometimes this was characterized as a marriage between king and a goddess who embodied the sovereignty of the land. In the reign of a good king, it was believed, the forces of society and nature would be in harmony and there would be abundance and prosperity. As institutions of kingship between, became more Christianized, the, pre, the pagan and prehistoric associations of Tara were marginalized. In the life of St. Patrick, penned by Mirchu in the 7th century, Tara was presented as a site of dramatic confrontation between St. Patrick and the druids of Loger MacNeil, King of Tara, where the saint was victorious. From the 7th century, another site, a tell town north of Tara, was favoured for assemblies. This prehistoric mound lay near Donna Patrick, an important early church named after St. Patrick. The meeting at Telltown aspired to be an annual event. It was noted in the annals of Ulster where the assembly was not held in the years 873, 876, and 878. Assemblies were integral to the workings of early Irish kingdoms. According to the 8th century law text Crith Gablach, an assembly or Onach was where a king could form treaties, issue edicts, and order military levies. These gatherings became a magnet for other activities, including sport, entertainment, and trade. The old Irish word Onach gave rise to a modern Irish Enoch, meaning a fair, reflecting its social and economic dimensions. These assemblies could operate at the level of a Tuatha or major province. The one at Telltown was the most famous. Meeting between, meetings between kings also happened at provincial or national level. An important example is the Royal Assembly, the Rigdal, held at Beer in 697 at the border between Munster and the lands of the Unail. This was combined with a synod at which kings and clerics operate, cooperated in the promulgation of an edict, Cain Adomnean or Lex Innocentium, Law of the Innocents, which sought to protect non-combatants in war and to boost the authority of the Church of Iona. In the mid-century, the Unail, Overking, Male, Shocknail, Macarail, Ruinid, used royal assemblies as a diplomatic method to extend his authority across the northern, uni northern half of Ireland and into, Mun into Munster. Assemblies, Onig and Rigdala, were thus not only a demonstration of royal power, but also a means of d resolving political tensions and avoiding conflicts. Assemblies were occasions where laws might be promulgated. Might be promulgated. The word rechtig, rechtig describes a legal enactment by a king made in special circumstances. The term could, be co could cover royal and religious edicts to legal pronouncements intended to strengthen existing laws at times of social stre stress. They could bind all those under the authority of the king, and sometimes it reflected the relationship between a king and a church in promoting the laws of a particular patron saint. saint. Kings had legal functions beyond the issue, issuing of edicts, and although they were limited in scope, compared to the legal prerogatives of Carolingian or Anglo-Saxon kings. A king could afford legal protection to subjects who came to his court seeking sanctuary, and his testimony had the highest status in a legal case. The king's household also act acted as a court of appeal for his subjects. His he could settle disputed legal matters directly by acting as a judge, or he might defer cases to a professional judge or advisor. 
the fairness of a king's judgment was treated as an essential feature of his leadership in literature about kingship. Ill consequences of a natural, human, or supernatural variety was said to result from bad judgment. A variety of sagas, law tracts, and wisdom literature highlighted the importance of royal justice, or fear flem flahamon, that will bring not only harmony to his people, but also good luck and abundance in the natural world. The notion of justice extended beyond legal judgment to other aspects of a king's conduct. There were taboos that certain kings must not break, break, indicating expectations of royal conduct and endowing the figure of a king with a supernatural mystique. The law tract, Krit Gabloch, is even specific enough to outline what a king should do on each day of the week, judging legal cases on Mondays and Saturdays, drinking ale on Sundays, playing board games on Tuesdays, hunting on Wednesdays, sex on Thursdays, and horse racing on Saturdays. In practice, it seems unlikely that the life of a king was so neatly compartmentalized. The laws prohibited kings from losing their honor by engaging in manual work, fleeing from battle, or engaging in or tolerating other acts that could damage their reputation. It was also incumbent on the king to never be alone. Kings relied on the support of kinfolk, advisors and allies, and subjects to succeed. These relationships were exercised through mutual exchanges of gifts and goods, services and protection. The reciprocity was not, however, equally balanced. Those at the top of the hierarchy, hmm, those at the top of the hierarchy, bound, bound those of lower status into a contract where they expected to receive more over the long term than they gave. The resulting accumulation of wealth, labor, and military resources underpinned royal power. To exact their share of the bargain, kings and their retinues did not reside in one place but traveled in circuits. Their subjects provided hospitality, which provided a royal household with its day-to-day -day needs. Laws attempted to regulate what the king and his retinue were entitled to receive. However, there is a lack of consistency in written accounts, which suggests that these obligations were negotiated from time to time. According to the law text Krit Gablok, the king of Atua should be entertained with up to twelve men while travelling on public business, while a provincial king might have a retinue of thirty. The old Irish poem on the Argilia, a group of dynast dynasties whose power was focused around Monaghan, Armagh, Tyrone and Derry, limited hospitality given to the kings of Tara to a hundred followers. The arrival of a royal retinue must have been a significant economic burden to their hosts, especially during the winter months. As kings travelled, they would stay at royal forts, either their own or those of a client. The fort, or doon, was a place where food renders were collected, or where an army might be assembled. It also acted as a royal court or centre of public life, where the people could visit their ruler. The maintenance of forts and the roads that led to them was another obligation that a king could impose on his clients, thus creating a network of royal sites. While kings might follow a circuit around client kingdoms, travel was also a way that he could display and enforce power over areas that had recently been subjugated. A king might also subject an intransigent or disobedient people by entering their land by force and exacting tribute in cattle or other goods. In 1005, Brian Baru of Munster set out on an expedition to cement his authority as over king of Ireland, travelling to Telltown, Tell County Meath, and then to Armagh. He camped at the royal site of, Na site of Navan Fort and visited the royal seat of Rathmore where he received the submission of local kings, demonstrating his dominion over the farthest province of Ireland from his own turf. Each of the royal sites Brian visited was a symbolic of his ambitions. I think it was around this point, kind of this time, that Brian Baru's power was at its height, when you could say that he was practically uh, high king of Ireland. Uh, nearing there, nearing that level, but there was al always going to be, uh, there was always going to be thrown off eventually. Wherever the king travelled, key members of the royal household followed him, or travelled with him. They included not only family, servants, and guards, but also select clients, political hostages, entertainers, clerics, and administrators. Some royal agents, such as the poet, crossed categories. The poet could perform as an entertainer, but also acted as a royal spin doctor or advisor. 
Others might accompany the household in a temporary capacity to serve a specific function. The complexity of royal administration seems to have increased from the 8th to 11th centuries as over kings sought to extend their powers. Hello, clever. Welcome in, welcome in. And thank you for the hydrate. I hope you're doing very well. We're actually almost finished. I'm probably going to be reading for another little bit. But, uh, but thank you for dropping in. It's nice to see you. I hope you're, I hope you're doing very, very well. Uh, <clears throat> the 8th century text, Frefola Rig Cashel Frituaha Moman, depicts the court of an overking of Munster staffed, staffed by officials from sub subordinate kingdoms. The Richter, an official who might serve as a steward or revenue connector, collector, is mentioned in law texts. From the 11th century, the Richter, actually, Richter, Richter, yeah, that's probably it, Richter. Teure, maybe. Rech Teure. Yeah, Rech Teure, that's it. Was important enough to be mentioned in Chronicles. They could also act as a royal agent outside of royal households, presiding over a fort or town. Advis advisors, come early, for kingdoms are also recorded, as are Murig, whose duties might include overseeing royal property, enforcing agreements and holding hostages. A Mura could also act as a remote agent or royal authority, operating in a specific dis district. Sometimes these officials were combined with high ecclesiastical positions. For example, Muradach, son of Don Donal, is recorded as deputy abbot, abbot of Armagh, chief steward, ard mayor of Southern O'Neill, and chief counsellor, Cain Ad Cormach of Brega, at his death in 924. It, it kind of makes me think of, like, those guys who are directors and, like, on the board of directors for, like, 20 different companies. All in, like, different sectors. Where I think, like, they can't get any work done. They probably just spend all their time reading, like, a couple of reports on the company and attending the directors' meetings. From 9th century... Overkings might appoint a deputy to wield authority over during periods of absence from their home, from their home kingdom. The term Airy is first recorded from 960 as a title for a viceroy. By the 12th century, the term was shifting to identify petty kings who could be treated as hereditary local governors for their overking. As the power of the overkings grew, they increasingly interfered in the affairs of their subkings. For example, they might ex may take executive decisions in matters of succession or dividing territories. In the mid 9th century, Mael Shachnail Mael Ruinid laboured to turn the ideal pan Irish hegemony of the legendary King of Tara into a realistic ambition. His military interventions in Munster and Ulster in, eight, in the 850s extended the power of the Unail. Nevertheless, the failure of the future O'Neill kings to secure tight control over Munster, Connacht, and the rich resources of the coastal towns ruled by Viking dynasties heralded their eventual decline. And one could say, and I've seen it very well argued, that the success of the O'Neill in pushing back any of the Vikings from landing in the Ulster and kind of their territories mainly may have contributed heavily to the fact that they weren't able to more easily gain control over over those very lucrative and very capable warriors. At the end of the 10th century, a Munster overking, Brian Beru, would take on the ambition of former kings of Tara, and he succeeded briefly in uniting Ireland under his rule. After 1022, the title of the King of Tara ceased to connote pretensions to island-wide power, but nearly denoted the over-king of Meath. In the 11th century, in the 11th and 12th centuries, over-kings of different provinces would battle it out to be King of Ireland. Warfare Military prowess was one of the essential qualities demanded of a medieval king. It was incumbent, incumbent upon him not only to defend people, but also to use a threat of force to prevent feuds among his subjects. 
the warrior who fa- whose failure or success reflected on his king was an esteemed figure in Irish society. Such men play an prominent role in myths, legends, and accounts of battles. Just as modern newspapers are filled with records of violence, so too are medieval chronicles. Texts Texts risk giving an exaggerated view of endemic warfare, but archaeology tells its own story. About 140 early medieval cemeteries have been exa- excavated in Ireland, ranging from around 400 to 1200 AD. Evidence of weapon trauma, trauma on skeletons have been recovered from 18 sites. A few appear to have suffered very grisly deaths indeed. Many other bodies have suffered violence without it showing signs on the skeleton. Could also have suffered violence. Dispropor- disproportionately, the individuals who suffered heavy blows from sharp implements were adult men. A number of these appear to have been trained warriors with shoulder problems that could reflect repetitive sp- stress from spear thrusting or javelin throwing. At Mount Gamble Cemetery, County Dublin, the skeletons that exhibit weapon traumas belonged to men of above average stature and health. It seems that kings and warriors could play a high price for their status. Archaeology and art history provide insights into the weapons that were used in the early Middle Ages. <laughs> You're so late, you miss so much reading. It's actually nearly at the end. I'm probably going to do one or two more pages. But uh, thank you for coming along. Laughs a lot. It's fine, don't you worry. It's always nice to have you here. Um, oh, is this a new PNG or is the lighting playing a trick on me? It's it's very much the lighting, and that's because I uh, to try and make myself look like I'm more in the scene. I have muted my colors. I've kind of made myself darker. Actually, no, I didn't mute my colors. That would be like vibrancy or hue. I just I just turned down the brightness on my on my thing to make it look like I'm kind of in the in the dark a little bit more. You need to head to bed soon teaching tomorrow. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, I need to go to bed soon as well. There is a thing, uh, and I'll give you guys a little bit, a little bit of, uh, Rua, Rua news. Summer holidays are almost over. Oh, and you know, you have to work like the rest of the world. <laughs> um, I got an update on my models rigging, and it looks really good. Oh my god, it looks so good. I'm so happy about it. Um, and I just, I just got, I just got a thought about it because there is like an app or a, a feature you can add to your live 2D model that sort of puts them into the scene. It kind of helps like shadows and light from the scene will show up on them. I don't know how it does it, but it's, it's basically just something that makes you look more natural on the scene. So you're not just like this bright character on like a dark scene or something. And it makes the light sources look a lot more like you're actually standing in front of the light. Archaeology <clears throat> and art history provides insights into the weapons that were used in early medieval ages. Illustrations of warriors are found in manuscripts such as the Book of Kills and in sculpture as at White Island, County Fermanagh. These show a small round shield and a spear to be the standard equipment of warriors. Spears were suited for both throwing and for hand-to-hand combat. Elite fighters might be expected to arrive at battle on horseback and fight with swords. Over time, the technology of war changed as state-of-the-art weapons and tactics were introduced. The Viking Age witnessed the adoption of the battle axe as a weapon that was suited to close combat, but also cheaper to produce than a sword. Archery was also also increased in significance from the 9th century. I know that a, a lot of the... Irish warfare was centered around more effectively skirmishers and javelin throwers, um, but they were very, very good javelin throwers. From the mid ninth, mid tenth century, arrowheads were used as a type of design to pierce armor. This suggests that armor became increasingly common in battle, at least among the Hiberno Scandinavians. Swords also improved in quality. These reflect changes. Infle- these changes reflect increasing investment in warfare over time, as royal resources increased and large-scale military campaigns became more common. <gasps> hi, 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 hi! <laughs> welcome in, Lapis. Welcome in, welcome in. Sorry, Caps. No, I, oh, I thought I thought you were just happy to see me. I thought you were just happy to be here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
how you doing, Lapis? I hope you're having a very good week. I hope it's going nice and quick for you. You are all cute. Choo. <laughs> um, yeah. Everyone's coming in at like the last moment. We're, we're almost going to be finishing up soon. Um, I might talk for a little bit, though. I can definitely talk for a little bit. But I'm just going to finish off this uh, section. It's like a pa page in a bit. At the beginning of the period under discussion, the mobility of Irish warriors at sea, as well as at sea, was well known due to their attacks on post-Roman Britain. The British write writer Gildas refers to them travelling in coracles. The military levels recorded in Munogidish Senchosa for Nalban, a text compiled in text. 10th century from 7th or 8th century materials, suggests that the ability to mobilize troops by sea remained important in Gaelic coastal communities, and occasional references to fleets are found in Irish chronicles during the 10th, during the 7th and 8th century. It's okay, listening to your reading, even if it's just a few, mon few minutes is always a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, Lapis. Well, I hope you can, I hope it helps you relax like, like little Rua over there. Rua comfy, sitting on his little log. Warmed by the fire. I hope that's how all of you guys can be. Scandinavian settlement in Ireland. In the 9th century provided advanced maritime technology. A plethora of records from 830s to the 850s suggests that longships frequented the coasts and inland waterways of Ireland. Each of the coastal fortresses established by Vikings seems to have had its own fleet. This development may have spurred Irish kings on to improve their own naval capacity, not only against the Vikings, but also in the field of interprovincial warfare. And this would be very important because there's so many, there's a lot of waterways in Ireland, so if you could have quick strike forces and raiding groups along these riverways, it could definitely be very handy. The increasing use of naval warfare among the Irish is noted from the late 10th century. The construction of Scandinavian-style ships in Ireland in the mid-11th century is indicated by the find that the warship Scudalev II scuttled in Roskilde Forge, which was found to be built from Irish oak. The fleet of Dublin was probably the best in Ireland, and during the 11th century it would be engaged from time to time in overseas campaigns. The resources needed to maintain these ships were a significant drain on the economy, although the costs might be alleviated by slave-taking, plunder, and mercenary ventures. The introduction of the Norse word led ledang in, is that it? I don't know how to pronounce that letter, into Irish by the 11th century, may indicate that a Scandinavian system of raising fleets and crews had been introduced to the island to help manage the rising cost and activities of fleets. Throughout the Middle Ages, warfare on land often took the form of raids, carrying away profitable wealth and causing a level of destruction that could weaken a rival king and bring death, enslavement, or famine to his people. A king could call on his retinue to support him in battle. This was a diverse group of men bound to, to a ruler through personal ties. Military obligations were also placed upon rival subject, royal subjects and clients, peoples to supply campaigns with goods and men. A poem dated to around 700 AD outlines the relationship between the Arigiala, a people whose territory lay between Ulster and Mead, and their Unail overlords. The text indicates the contingents were supplied and led by the kings of Klein peoples. As overkings became more powerful from the 9th century, the potential size and reach of the campaigns increased. Professional warriors or mercenaries might also be employed to gain an advantage in battle. These included Viking warriors. Relations between Hiberno-Scandinavian ports and Irish kings were conditioned by the latter's need for military resources. The fleets and militias of Limerick and Waterford aided the rise of the Munster overking Brian Boru in the late 10th and, 11th, and early 11th centuries. The emergence of new terms Oglachas, to describe warrior service, and Torostal and Enarad as payments given for military service by 1100 AD suggests the increasing specialization of military activity. The 11th century also witnessed increasing investment in fortress building and bridge building to secure lines of communication and defense in large-scale wars. 
Violence was often part of a wider strategy for political control that could include alliances against an enemy, assassination of high-status opponents, interference in dynastic succession, and winning the support of a powerful ecclesiastical figure. The threat of violence could bring rival parties into a treaty, and churchmen sometimes served as negotiators in these agreements. The Church of Ireland had a mixed relationship with violence. On the one hand, it issued regulations intended to inhibit violence and the moral chaos that could result. The best known of these is Cain Adamnean or Lex Innocentium, or the Law of Innocence, which, would resu- which was issued in 697. The purpose of this law was to help protect women, children and clerics from violence by imposing fines on their killers. On the other hand, rivalry between religious houses was also a cause of armed conflict. The stereotype that churches were unarmed targets when, or unarmed targets for Viking aggression from the eight, late 8th century should be qualified. Battles took place between churches particularly during the late 8th and early 9th century, including conflict between the supporters of Clonmac Noyes County Offaly and Burr County Offaly in 760 AD. <laughs> Those were some tough old priests and and monks. Damn. The wars may have reflected the growing wealth of the church and increased competition, perhaps induced by the working out of a system of territorial jurisdiction. As churches were bound up with political order, they also became embroiled in the conflict of kings. The raiding of churches in a recurrent is a recurrent feature of Irish warfare during the Middle Ages. It was not an innovation introduced by Vikings. In the growing scale of interprovincial warfare in the 11th century, leading churchmen, including the abbot of Armagh, Armagh, became powerful allies and arbiters of peace. The next chapter, or not next chapter, but the next section of this chapter, deals with local histories, and it looks like it's going to talk about various specific groups. So the O'Neill, the Northern O'Neill, the Southern O'Neill, and... uh, Ulster, and it looks like it's going to talk about a lot of the specific groups in those areas, so I think that'll be a very interesting read. But for now, I'm going to give my voice a rest. It's been almost roughly two hours of of reading, and I hope for, for those of you who are either here from close to the very beginning or joined halfway through, or even for the last couple of minutes that you guys were able to enjoy and relax and Hopefully, maybe learn a little bit of something, or maybe you just had me on in the background as, as some kind of nice sounds. I don't know. <laughs> and thank you, Last Lot, for the hydrate redeem. I was just picking up my water bottle. Talking like kind of softly and reading is definitely more of a a little bit more straining on the on the throat than uh, than just commentating on gaming. I think it's because I have very little breaks. Like I can take breaks while I'm while I'm being a gamer. <laughs> um, or maybe it's because I'm talking louder and kind of talking softly is a little bit more. Mm. You motherfucker! You bastard! All right, I will do these and then I will probably I will do these because I feel I'm feeling a lot better in terms of that injury. So I will do these very quickly. And hang on, let me move this. And then I will look for someone to read. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Ugh. Nice, easy. Nice, easy 20. 20 push-ups. You forgot about the injury. It's it's a lot better, I will say. Um, I think the two days of rest that I gave it... I didn't even actually know three days of rest. Um, definitely helped. Like, I was in the gym today. Taking it very light. Taking it very easy. But, uh... No, I'm not a stinky cheese. <laughs> I had a shower after the gym today. <laughs> I'm not stinky. 
I probably will have a shower though when I wake up in the morning too. Uh, who's doing something? Who could we? Who could we raid into? Is anyone doing ASMR? Ooh. Oh, we could. Yeah, we could raid into Rakudo. Rakudo's a. He's a little bit more. Um, he has a great, very cozy uh, German voice. Could be Austrian, but I know it's definitely German. Um, but great audio quality and a great voice. So I'm going to send you guys off over to Rakudo. And I'm going to go have a cup of tea and uh, soothe my voice. Maybe with a little, little bit of honey. But thank you all for joining me. It's always been a pl it's always a pleasure. And uh, okay. oh wait a minute. Oh no. Oh yes, I forgot. I was using um. I was using. <laughs> you could actually hear them, because my uh, these new sounds, these foresty sounds, I'm using are uh, are from my browser. I'm going to record them later to use them as a separate thing. But I was using them today because they were quite nice. Quite nice. But uh, go give go give Rakudo some love. I think he's being... I think he's currently hanging himself from from the roof. Unfortunately, I can only see his feet. But I will see you guys later. Gred Mila Mahagat and Slangafoil. That's it.